Well, we begin finally, some of you were wondering, when is Brian going to get back to James chapter 5? We'd gone James chapter 1 and 2, James 3 and 4, and then we took a pause. Well, we come back to this new series, what it means when you see faith at work, watching faith at work, when faith works, it should be something that people see. And so we begin with the first message in James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, when riches become rotten. That's the name of the study today, when riches become rotten. Uh, You ever wonder how many new billion-dollar-plus companies have come on the scene? Well, let me give you a few of them in the last couple of two or three years. Uh, There's a meditation app company uh, that helps people to ease their minds. Uh, Another company is uh, developing driverless cars, okay? How many of you would get in a driverless car, you know, to go across town? Another company, Too Simple, T-U-Simple. Do you know what Too Simple is? Too Simple is developing self-driving long-distance trucks. Wow, think about that the next time you pass one of those on I-81. And then you have a men's wellness company called Hims, DoorDash, a food home delivery company, Casper, the very first bed-in-the-box company, delivers to your door by mail or pick yours up at your local Target store, and Impossible Foods, a plant-based burger company, all right? Now, I'm not going to try it, but you try it, and then come tell me how it tastes, okay? Uh, All these companies have one thing in common. They are all billion-dollar companies companies. Now, in James chapter 5, it is one of the most interesting and in some ways challenging chapters in all the New Testament. Right off the bat, we're wondering, who is James talking to? Who is he talking about? James chapter 5 almost sounds like a proverb when you first begin to read it. Now, I know some of you were thinking as soon as you were hearing Rob and and Elaine uh, read the text and pray, and, and I always find it interesting how God will lead a member of our church to pray for the message. And uh, what, Rob, what you pray today, that's going to be right in line with where we're going. And uh, that is always an encouragement to me to hear our members pray for our services and our studies. Now, you might be thinking, well, I'm not rich. This sermon isn't for me. I can just put it on automatic and rest for a few minutes. No, 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 no. Do you realize that if you have more than one change of clothes, if you sleep somewhere tonight that's not a little lean-to built by sticks or mud, and if you have a meal that you are planning on being able to eat tomorrow, then you are in the one percentile of this world's over seven billion population. One percentile. In, in, In a way of the terms of wealth, And all of us in this room, whoever we are, will experience more comfort, more convenience, more wealth than some people will know for even a single day throughout their entire lives in this world. For many people, that'd be true. Now, James begins this chapter, and he says, here's the words, come now. Come now. Now, do you know what he's talking about? Uh, We might say this way, look here, look here. Or or some of us might say, if you're a teacher or maybe a coach or maybe even a parent, listen up. Uh, He wants us to hear what he's saying. And and the reason why he wants us to hear what he's saying is, uh, and by the way, it's the same phrase that he uses basically in James chapter 4, verse 13. Uh, He's introducing a warning, you know, uh, look out, we might say. There are, there's a danger ahead. James is warning his readers that there is an impending, inescapable judgment uh, that's coming for those who've determined to hold to a particular attitude, a disposition, a way of thinking, a worldview, a mindset to be described or defined. He's talking about something bigger than just an act. He's talking about an attitude of one's life. And he then proceeds, as we've already read together just a few moments ago, to describe the futility of making your life about gaining or keeping worldly wealth and thinking that this is going to give you a fulfilling life, much less give you confidence 
as you face judgment in the life that is to come. Now, the question is this. Who is James talking about? Who's James talking about? Well, in verse 7, James obviously, and we'll be talking about verse 7 next week, he addresses Christians. He uses the word brethren. But in verses 1 through 6, he could be talking about lost rich people, or he could be talking about saved rich people. Just because you are a follower of Jesus Christ doesn't mean that you are guaranteed to be protected against ever giving in to trusting in whatever amounts of money or wealth that you have more than your master. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you won't be tempted to choose to be satisfied with giggles and grins and the conveniences, uh, conveniences that you enjoy temporarily in this life to satisfy you. Actually, Satan uses them to distract us from all that we're missing out on by not following Christ with our whole heart and loving him accordingly. Well, there's three things I want to see in these six verses quickly this morning. And the first is this, there's a reason to weep. Number one, a reason to weep. For the miseries, he says, that are coming upon you. In other words, James is saying there are those who are trying to, who are spending all of their time and life and efforts to acquire things that will not satisfy, will not leave them in lasting contentment, and, uh, and things that they cannot take with them when they die. Uh, no matter if it's Simpson or Lots or Okies, I've yet to see any of our local funeral homes offer a U-Haul trailer option to hook up to a hearse on the way to one of the cemeteries. He's talking about those that have exchanged, those that have twisted the purpose of their possessions, they have magnified the gifts against the giver. Instead of possessing their riches, they are guilty, James says, of being possessed by their possessions. He says the result of having misplaced priorities is what? Weeping and howling. Weeping and howling. These words literally mean to cry and to groan. Not a pretty picture, is it? Uh, James is being very clear. If you build your life on these things that the world gives and that the world can take away, then you are building your life on something that ultimately is going to disappoint you. Ultimately, it's going to fail you. It's going to let you down, and your response is going to be one of weeping and crying and groaning. Physical things will never produce spiritual joy. You know that? Physical things will never produce physical joy. I came across an interesting study in preparation for this message this morning. Uh, it, it was printed in Times Magazine. It happened uh, on February 26, 1995. Now, Bearings is one of the oldest, uh, most well-established banks in all of Great Britain, or was. And it announced on that day that it was seeking bankruptcy protection after losing nearly one billion dollars in gambling on a stock investment. In 1994, the article said, the chief trader at Bering Singapore office, who by the way was 28 years old, okay, 28 years old, and he began betting big on Japan's Nikkei market, their stock market, and then disaster struck. You know what happened in January 23rd of 1995? There was an earthquake that hit Kobe, Japan. Now, the Nikkei plunged over a thousand points, which was extremely big at that time in Japan, a devastating economic blow. But instead of counting and cutting their losses, do you know what this young 28-year-old trader did? He doubled down and he doubled the bank's investment instead of freezing it. And guess what? Things did not turn around as he had hoped. And pretty soon, the London Bank, this historic bank office, had put up nearly $900 million to support its failing investments and position on the Singapore market. Bearings finally ran out of capital. And, and, and back then, you would think so. If you lose a billion dollars as a bank, you're probably going to run out of capital. And, and, and so, uh, they ended up... Uh, losing uh, the bank itself. Now, the question was asked, how could one in Time Magazine, how could one 28-year-old trader in Singapore lose nearly a billion dollars and ruin a 233-year-old British bank? And according to Time, 
This was the problem, a lack of supervision. And the article reads, London allowed the Singapore trader to take control of both the trading desk and the backroom settlement operation in Singapore. It's a mix that can be, and in this case was, toxic. A trader keeping his own books is like a schoolboy grading his own test. How many of us in middle school would love to grade our own test? The temptation to cheat can be overwhelming if the stakes are high enough. Friends, if we build our lives on the physical rather than the spiritual, uh, if we put our hope in or our joy in, uh, in the financial rather than the biblical, then do you know what we're doing? We're guilty of cheating ourselves of the things that matter most. You can't but drive one car at a time. Uh, you, you can't cheat God and experience God's fulfillment in your life at the same time. The word riches are wealth, and if you look at James 2 and 3, look at James 2 and 3. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded. Your riches have rotted. Now, what does that mean? How does money rot? Well, he's not talking about money. Remember, it was an agrarian economy and society, and so the more grain, the more crops, the more produce you had, the wealthier you were. And so this is describing someone that had a lot of wealth, but it just became stagnant. It, it stayed in the barn too long, and it rotted. Maybe it got wet. Maybe the roof leaked. I don't know. But all this wealth now is rotted. And, and then he goes on to say, not only uh, your riches have rotted, but your garments are moth-eaten. And, and as some of us are discovering, as we're getting out our winter clothes, now that fall is officially here, and, and hasn't it been some beautiful days since the storms passed by? Wow, what beautiful weather God has been blessing us with. And we're discovering, some of us, that there's little moth holes in some of our clothes, moth-eaten. And then your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you. In other words, your gold and silver, always the standard of wealth in the world, has now lost its value. Do you remember something that Jesus said that underscores for us what James is talking about here in chapter 5? Do you remember in um, Luke's gospel, Jesus told the story about a rich man. And man, he had a banner year, maybe several banner years. And he had all these grains and all these crops. He had more than he could store in the barns that he had. And so he said, I'll tell you. And so this is what Jesus said. Uh, the rich man talking to himself in Luke chapter 12, Jesus said, and I will say to my soul, the rich man did, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. You ever heard that phrase before? It just sounds like modern day advertising in America, doesn't it? Sure it does. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you then whose will those things be which you have provided? And Jesus then said, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Overall, James is teaching us this point. Do not make the mistake of misusing your riches, whatever amount of money or wealth that God has given to you, and let that become something that you rely upon and uh, look to in place of faith or in place of the one in whom you have placed your faith, which should be Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian and is. Uh, God gave you whatever is good. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from above. You've got something good, God gave it to you. So we're not to trust in the gifts more than the giver. We're not to take more joy in the presence than the one who was the presenter and provider for those presents. Yet the temptation is this. The more that we have, the greater the temptation will be to rely upon it, not the Lord. Now, this is not just true as a nation. We see it all over America today, don't we? This is true even in the church. The longer things go well and there's no immediate crisis, well, the more we tend to take God for granted and the more we tend to focus on that which we cannot take with us. And pretty soon we talk like the world, we act like the world, we're living like the world, we're looking like the world, we're sounding like the world, and we're thinking like the world. And instead of being salt and light and the church imposing its 
will and witness and work on the world, transforming the hearts of souls of lost men and women, winning them to faith in Jesus Christ and making disciples. The world instead is being, it seems at times, more successful in transforming or rather conforming us as Christians into its image. We're to be faithful. We're to be wise. We're to be generous managers of all that God has blessed us with and always give God, get this, access to whatever we have. We don't look at God or we come to worship or any other time when we're thinking about Him with white knuckles, holding on tight. Instead, we give God or let Him have access with whatever He has given to us. The principle is this. Would we misplace our priorities upon the th- and put them on the things of the world that cannot last, then we are cheating ourselves of the spiritual goodness and blessing of God in our lives, and we are revealing the condition of our souls. We are lacking spiritually. Back when Poland ceased to become a communist nation and became a free nation. Its first president after communism was a, was a man by the name of Lech Walesa, remember? And, and this is what he said, the first elected president of Poland after the fall of communism. And it's interesting, remember, uh, this he said um, um, years ago, many years ago, listen to what he said, Americans are drifting away from spiritual values as they become richer. He said that sooner or later we will have to go back to our fundamental values, back to God, the truth, the truth which is in God. That's the president of Poland. And then he made a most interesting statement. This is what else he said. We look to America and we expect from you a spiritual richness to meet the aspirations of the 20th century. I don't think the world can say that in looking to America in the 21st century, can it? No. We need revival, and it needs to start with the church. Understand this about misplaced priorities. Misplaced priorities will always lead to unwanted outcomes. If you ignore what God's Word says, if you place your priorities uh, somewhere else, other than beginning with the first place love for Christ, then you are headed in a direction of an unwanted outcome in your life. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. Number two, a recompense to suffer quickly, a recompense to suffer. The laborers, James writes, are crying out against you. A danger of loving riches and wealth is this. You'll do anything to get them, and you'll do anything to keep them even if that means robbing others. That's what James is talking about in verse 4. He condemns the way that some are getting rich. He's not condemning being rich. You remember what Paul said to Timothy? It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. Not getting money, not having money, loving money. Because when you love money, then everything else begins to, to become skewed. You begin to divert You are distracted. You're divided in your heart and your attentions. Paul said it's the root of all evil. What was happening? These rich people were sending out men and possibly women as day laborers to harvest their crops. Now, at the end of every day, they were supposed to pay them. Why? Because oftentimes these day laborers were so poor that if they didn't get paid at the end of the day, they wouldn't have any money to buy food to eat that evening or have anything left over for breakfast the next morning. And so they weren't paying them. Uh, Notice what the Bible says. He says, behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, James says, which you kept back by fraud. Look what they're doing. They are crying out against you. Now, that doesn't mean the laborers are crying out publicly. Nowhere does James say, or does God say, protest, march, threaten a boycott, riot, whatever, to get your justice attention. That's all he's talking about. It might be that God who sees everything and knows everything is paying attention as he always does. He sees what's happening, and their very sufferings cry out to him as a witness against those that are harming them. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You know what that phrase, the Lord of hosts, means? The Lord of armies. 
It, it describes that, that God is God in authority, in power, in presence, in every way, shape, and form. Now, to be sure to get this, understand, when we get our riches at the expense of robbing from others, then not only are we at odds of those that we have robbed, we are also at odds with God himself. God is their champion. God will ultimately bring justice. You know, I really think one of the evidences for the day of judgment of the Lord, one of the evidences of another life after this one, the reality of of eternity and the judgment of God is so many times there's no justice in this world. Have you noticed that? So many times there's no justice in this world. And you think, God, what about? Hey, one day God who is holy and just will measure and mete out all the judgment and justice that is needed. Hold on. If you don't see justice in this life, understand there will be justice in the next God is a just God. He doesn't wink at sin. He doesn't look away from uh, immorality. He doesn't ignore uh, injustice and wrong and wrongdoing. You know, you might think that you can take advantage of someone else, and maybe you have, but you can never take advantage of God. Amen? God is our judge. Now, as a side note, I want to go back because of our times today are so tumultuous and, and, um, and so fraught with so much anger. You know, anyone that, that gets robbed of their uh, bonus, of their compensation, of, of the salary that they had agreed to work for, um, especially if it meant you and your family couldn't eat, man, that just makes you angry. But, but he's not saying that they should respond in kind by getting angry and displaying anger in a way that, that uh, uh, is disruptive or revolutionary. Uh, he describes the situation with the understanding that God is the judge, and God has said, vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord, I will repay. And this is where we come back as Christians, where we trust God to be our defender ultimately, not a human judge. We trust God to be our provider ultimately. Our lives, our futures, our souls, and it's up to us, our hearts should be in his hands. Look at verse 5. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Now, now what is that about? It's talking about that if you're stealing and hoarding from others, if you're living a selfish life, uh, holding on to all that you can for yourself, you are flying in the face of the very purpose of why God has blessed you to begin with. God blesses us to use us. Not that we would have white knuckled clenched fists, but open hands as we give back to Him, as God asks us to give back to Him. Uh, this is what He's talking about and describing in this particular text for us. Now, be sure that when we get riches at the expense of others, then we ourselves are going to face God's judgment one way or another. Now, do you know how to guard against being in a situation uh, like what James is describing, where you're a, a rich person facing the judgment of God for the way that you got your priorities out of whack? Be generous. You say, I don't feel like being generous. That's why you need to be generous. If you don't want to be generous, if you don't feel like being generous, you probably need to be generous. It's one of the best signs. You see, when you are generous and do the right thing, then the right feelings follow. If you wait for the right feelings to come first, you'll never do the right thing. It's one of the principles of basic biblical counseling. And so never stop giving. It's not a matter of how much you have in the bank. It is really all a matter about how much of your heart have you given to the Lord. Now, notice a couple of words quickly. When he says slaughter, do you see that word? You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Uh, do you know what he's talking about? Uh, when Mary and I used to drive out west um, um, years ago, we would sometimes pass a stockyard. In a stockyard, you have all the cattle and the cows and the steers that are being sent off to be butchered and turned into hamburger meat and steaks for you and me. Well, guess what? 
Occasionally, you would have a cow, a steer, and he's underweight. Well, you don't want to butcher a cow or steer that's underweight because you're not going to get as much money on the hoof. So what do you do? You take that cow, you take that steer, and you section them off. You call them out of the crowd, take them away from the herd, and you put them in his own pen. And you give him as much water and food as he wants. Now, can you imagine you're the cow, and there you are in your own pen. You don't have to compete with all the other cows. You don't have to uh, uh, shoulder and squeeze in to eat. You get more food than you've ever had, and you're just sitting there enjoying one jawful after another. You think, this is great, until you weigh enough, and you lose your life. The cow doesn't understand what's waiting for them in the slaughter. The comparison, the comparison that James is giving us is simply this. The rich person who lives for the pleasures of their possessions in this life is storing up for themselves a day of grief and a day of death. And then in verse 6, the last verse, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. The word condemned is a judicial word that James is using here. It's one that speaks of somebody who wants to control the courts, or maybe they do, and no matter who brings a word against them because they've paid for judges and influenced the courts, then they've used their wealth to bribe and bring favor to themselves and to protect them from a legal perspective. So really the poor laborer has no place to go. Even if he goes to the court, guess what? No one is going to do anything about the injustice. The rich person is guilty, James says, as though they've committed murder against that person. A rabbinical uh, statement reads this way, as one that slays his neighbor is he that takes away his living. Uh, you see, here's the point that James is making. When you are stealing from someone, that's bad enough, but if you're stealing for someone where they need that to survive, to live, to provide for their family, to do good, then it's as though you've murdered them maybe financially or emotionally or mentally. Uh, some of us enjoy the movie The Sandlot. Remember the movie The Sandlot? And remember one of the phrase, one of the characters to the other, one of the kids, you're killing me, Smalls, you're killing me. Oh, well, that's really what the poor person is saying in this text, that the, the rich person, the person that they work for is killing them by stealing from them. Uh, something else we need to keep in mind, the Bible is very clear that in being generous, that doesn't begin outside of the church, it begins inside the church. Uh, the Bible says we're not to rob God of His tithes and offerings. That's one-tenth of all that He's given to us, Malachi chapter 3. And I want to tell you something good that God is doing in our church. Uh, even though we're still making our way back, we're about 81% of where we were in attendance on campus uh, the, prior to COVID. When you add our live stream uh, congregation and those watching with us, we're about 92%. Isn't that great? The average church in America is somewhere between 36 and 40%. God has really blessed our church, and we should always be thankful. I want to tell you something else that God is doing in blessing. For the first time in many, many, many years, we are um, easily within making this year's ministry operations budget. I, I, I don't mean making expenses, which we do every year. I'm talking about making the budget. And you know what a church budget is? It's a statement of faith by that congregation that we believe that God would have us to do these things with the dollars that God provides for us. And it's really a, a vote of faith. Every year when we do it in, in, at the end of the year, as we'll do not a very long way from now. And now we're at a place, and if we continue to be faithful church family, in our giving, be generous in our giving, we will meet or even exceed the ministry operations budget, which we haven't done in over a decade. Isn't that great? How good God is. And we should remember this, that God blesses us so that we might be a blessing to others. The ancient Jewish person would never think of going to a worship service and not bringing an offering. That's just what you did. 
It was because it reminded them not only all that God had given to them, it reminded them that the worship wasn't about them, the worship was about Him. And part of the way they remember that is the way that they would do what God had said, and that is to honor Him in their worship. Uh, I like this uh, quote from a Bible commentator from the 1800s. He wrote this, there is no sin in being rich. Where sin exists among the rich, it arises from the manner in which wealth is acquired, the spirit which it tends to engender in the heart, and the way in which it is used. Now, here's the point I want to make, prosperity. Prosperity doesn't make for generosity. You might be the most prosperous person here in this room. That doesn't make you generous. You, you think it should, but it doesn't. Nor does generosity have to have prosperity, in other, in other words, to exist. I've known some people that had the gift of giving, they had very little to give, but they gave anyway because that was God's gift and that's the way they operated in the body of Christ. Poverty doesn't make for godliness. Poverty doesn't make for godliness. But a first love for Christ leads to humility. And when we're humble, it is so much easier to be faithful it is so much easier to be faithful, whether it is with what God has given to us or how God wants to use us. So, we looked at a reason to weep, a recompense to suffer, and then we close with a retirement to avoid. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Uh, and Jesus made it very clear in Matthew chapter 6 that the retirement a retirement is we think of the next life. What are we laying up for the next life? And he said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven for where your treasure is, what does he say? There will your heart be also. And when this life begins to wind down, then suddenly you begin to realize what really matters most of all. You see, our money really does talk. What we do with it speaks about how we think, and volumes about how we're living. You see, the only real lasting treasure we have in this life is that which God has given to us in Christ, and then the good works of faith that we store up for ourselves by being obedient to Him and letting God use us and lead us as He wants to. Forgiveness and faith in Jesus Christ, by which a person can receive God's indescribable gift, that is a treasure that we will never, ever lose. Here's the point, how we need to see the life. Billy Graham used to say this. When we see this life as a dressing room, when we see this life as only a dressing room for the next life, then we will live differently here. I love that quote. And that sums up our third and last point. As we went back to to verse 3 when we looked at it, which said, you've laid up treasure in the last days. We want to be laying up the right treasure. And we do so by having the right look in realizing what this life is about and the life that is ahead that is to come. You know, for many of us, one day our family is going to gather around uh, a lawyer's office. And they're going to talk about uh, our desires or our plans or what we've said about the stuff we're leaving behind, which basically is all of it. And, and when we do, they'll realize what's important to us and what isn't. What is important to you? Because if the right things are important, you can expect the right reward and harvest. Galatians chapter 6 Look what the Bible says when it talks about the law of the harvest. In Galatians chapter 6, the Bible says that, uh, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Mary did not plant beans and end up getting watermelons. She got what she planted in her garden. And the same thing is true with the garden of our life. You know how this really came, came home for me this, this couple of weeks ago? Got a telephone call from Betty, my dad's wife. Remember, my mom, Betty, has been kicking up gold dust in heaven for about 11 years. Hard to believe that. And, uh, and Betty called me. I was down here at church on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, she said, I think your dad's having a stroke. We've called the ambulance. And, and I said, may I speak to him? She said, sure. So she put dad on the line, on the phone. And I was in my office, not far from where I am right now. 
And I could tell, uh, you couldn't understand anything Dad was saying. Uh, his speech was not just slurred, it was just garbled, you know. Uh, and I said, Dad, I want to pray for you right now. I want to pray together right now. And so I did, and I led us in prayer. And, and when I was through, the ambulance had arrived and, and, and picked him up um, and took him to the hospital. Uh, thankfully, he's now home, as I said, and, and we thank the Lord for the improvement he's made. A, a lot of that improvement I credit to those of you who've been praying for our family and praying for him. Now, I don't think I even said this to uh, Mary at the time. This is her first time to hear it. When I was talking to Dad, I couldn't understand what Dad was saying. And if you've ever talked to someone in the midst of a stroke, uh, it, you just can't understand anything that they're saying. Um, but you know what, you, what I did understand from my dad? Attitude. Attitude. The tone of what he was trying to say to me. And you know there were two words that came to my mind as I'm listening to him. I'm thinking, you know, I've heard a lot of people and talked to a lot of people in crisis, and they're panicked, they're fearful, they're, they're crying, they're nervous, uh, they, 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 they don't, they're frozen, they're paralyzed with fear. You know what I picked up in my dad's voice? He's 88 on his way to being 89. I picked up joy and love. Joy and love. Friend, when you put the right things in place, in your heart towards God. Display it in your life as best you can as God leads you to do. And when the time comes, in that moment when you may be very close to stepping into eternity, those rewards begin to come back. And what you've laid up for yourself in heaven will be what you will be able to enjoy for yourself that God will bless you on your way there. I fundamentally believe that. Are we living now to live again? Do you see this dressing, this life as a dressing room for a better life that's ahead? Do you understand that God's goodness is temporary in this life, but what He gives us in the next life is forever and will never be taken away? And so we can live with joy and liberty and generosity and humility because we know our great God is so good, so good. Thank you.